uh, Amit Datta and uh, Yale Makagon to talk about uh, their paper, uh, which looks uh, in a multidisciplinary way at um, how to explain discrimination in uh, an online advertising system that uh, was measured in an earlier study. So um, that's uh, kind of an excellent follow-on to, uh, to Till's paper. Okay, um, good morning everyone. Thank you for coming to our talk. Uh, today we'll discuss discrimination in online advertising and what the law has to say about it. This is sort of in line with what Latanya and Till sort of bri briefly mentioned in their talks. Given the multidisciplinary nature of this paper, we decided the two of us from different backgrounds should do the presentation in line with how we collaborated to write the paper in the first place. Uh, my name is Amit Datta and I have a computer science and engineering background and I'll be co-presenting with Yale Macagon, who is a lawyer by training. So let me first briefly mention the results from a prior study that motivated us to carry out this inquiry into discrimination. A couple years back, um, we carried out a study to detect discrimination on Google's advertising ecosystem, and we discovered that while exhibiting job-seeking behavior, the reported gender of simulated users does indeed cause Google to serve different ads. Two ads served by the same career coaching agency, the Barrett Group, uh, uh, were the most predictive of gender, and they caught our attention. They appeared to be about high-paying executive-level jobs. Um, so if you look at the first ad, uh, it has the title, 200K plus jobs, execs only. And this ad was served to 402 of the 500 simulated male users in our experiment, compared to just 60 of the 500 simulated female users. And altogether, the 402 male users uh, received the ad over 1,800 times, compared to just 300 times by the females. The second ad with a similar title also had skewed numbers. So Yale, uh, do you think the ways in which these ads from the Barrett Group were shown to users might have any legal consequences? <laughs> um. Amit, well, given those results, you know, <laughs> the, the first thing that comes to mind is that civil rights law makes it illegal to, uh, to advertise for jobs in a way that indicates a preference based on sex. And that prohibition is found here in Title VII uh, of the Civil Rights Act, specifically Section 704B, which we, we've got quoted on the slide here. And the purpose of this provision was to promote equality by preventing signaling to recipients of advertisements that uh, a particular category, like sex or race, was preferred. And the term sex was included in the statute to prevent signaling to women that they shouldn't apply to certain jobs. So this is a classic example of an ad that signals to its recipients that men are preferred over women for, uh, for an employment position. And these kinds of ads were very common in newspapers at the time that Title VII was passed in, in 1964. Now, once it was passed, it catalyzed action on the part of the EEOC, that's the federal agency that enforces Title VII, as well as state legislatures to pass uh, regulations and laws um, that, re that reflected the purpose of, of Title VII. And it sparked a lot of litigation related to the kind of classified, ad classified ads that we see here on the slide. So through a combination of the statute, um, EEOC regulations, and state law, the practice of advertising this way largely disappeared by the 1970s. So the findings that you're describing in the study that you mentioned earlier are occurring in a different context. You know, they're happening online rather than in a newspaper, 
but it still sounds like the kind of results that Title VII was designed to prevent. So in order to understand better whether Section 704 would apply in this context, we need to understand a little bit more how the system actually works. So how might these results have come about? Hmm, that's, that's a hard question, Yale, um, especially <laughs> given the black box nature of the ad ecosystem. But I can try to make some guesses. Let's first try to understand that the ad ecosystem has many different parties. So at the center of it sits Google, which is the ad network connecting advertisers with users. We have the Barrett Group, which provides the employment-related ads to Google. Uh, there are a whole bunch of other advertisers who are competing with the Barrett Group to reach the eyes of consumers. Uh, there are other users, both male and female, who interacted with Google Ads in the past and send various kinds of signals. And then there are other entities like publishers and ad exchanges who may also affect the ad ecosystem. Now, this model may not be accurate. Um, it represents my guess at how things are working based on Google's own help pages. And it helps us develop some scenarios. Now, assume this is the setting. One possibility is direct advertiser targeting by the Barrett Group. The Barrett Group may have asked Google to show their ads to males, and Google simply respected their wishes. In, in fact, posing as advertisers, we interacted with the Google platform to find that this is indeed a possibility. Uh, Google does allow targeting based on gender. Uh, this example shows targeting to the female demographic. And using this feature, we ended up creating stereotypically sexist employment ads, uh, specifically this ad for secretary jobs targeted to women, and an ad for truck driving jobs targeted to men. Not only did Google approve these ads, when we paid some money, we found that they got served exactly according to the targeting. Google's advertiser report told us that the secretary job ad got served over 56,000 times, and the truck driving job ad got served over 73,000 times, the first one all to females, and the second one all to males. And this was over the same 12-hour period. So we know that direct advertiser targeting is a possibility. What does Section 704B have to say if this were the case? Would the Barrett Group be liable? What about Google? So now that we know a little bit more about how the system works, we can look back to the language of Title VII to try to answer that question. Um, the first thing that, that we have to recognize is that the prohibition on discriminatory advertising in, in Title VII is limited to these four uh, listed categories here. Now with regard to the Barrett Group, the only category that could really potentially apply in this context is is uh, the third uh, uh, category here, the, the employment agency. And does, does this fit? Um, the Barrett Group calls itself a career coaching service. It doesn't really have any direct relationships with particular firms as far as we know. And the case law is pretty limited as far as an entity, entity like the Barrett Group is concerned. Um, so it's, it's not very clear whether they would fall within the definition of an employment agency. But if a court found that they did, then the Barrett Group would be prohibited from advertising on Google's ad network in this way. Um, Google, on the other hand, is probably not an employer or employment, employment agency in this specific setting. And none of the categories that are listed in Section 704B would really apply to Google in this context. So within the context of what you're describing, it's not likely that Title VII would apply to Google here regarding the employment ads that you, that you discovered. But this kind of targeting does raise uh, very interesting questions about online targeting of, of advertising in general that might implicate civil rights law. And if we look right next door to Title VII in the statute, there's Title VIII, uh, which applies to housing. Now, Title VIII of the Civil Rights Act um, seeks to guarantee equal housing opportunity regardless of, of several protected categories, um, including sex. And you see, if, if you put the two statutes side by side, the language is, is very similar. They're essentially identical, except for the fact that the Fair Housing Act does not have these, uh, these limiting categories to, to who it applies. And courts have actually found that this particular provision is directly applicable to entities like newspapers. However, even if we're talking about a situation where the ads in question implicated the Fair Housing Act, there's a catch. Uh, given that Google is an online intermediary, we have to consider the effect of another law, and that is Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. Section 230 was prompted by a case in 1995 that held a website liable for offensive content 
it was posted on one of its message boards. And in that case, the court held that the website was liable because it had deleted some messages um, and therefore became responsible for the messages that it failed to delete. Section 230 was responsible, uh, was a response to this ruling, and the purpose of the statute is to allow computer services to perform some editing on user-generated content without becoming liable for all unlawful messages that might be, uh, that they didn't edit or delete. More recently, courts have held the websites are protected by Section 230, so long as the means that they provide to third parties to publish that content can be considered what are called neutral tools. Um, and the idea there is that websites can provide tools for people to post content online, like drop-down menus or uh, make keyword suggestions, but they aren't responsible if people use those tools to actually post illegal content. So in many ways, the Communications Decency Act is a statute to be praised, given that it is what has allowed many useful aspects of the internet as we know it today to flourish. So in the scenario that you're describing, um, as long as Google is posting the Barrett Group's ads as, as requested, um, arguably Section 230 would, would, would apply. Uh, the check boxes to select male or female are analogous to other options that courts have found to, to be so-called neutral tools that allow computer services to retain their protection under Section 230. But, but hold on. Um, <laughs> I just pointed out one possible scenario where Google played kind of a passive role. What if Google played a far more active role in determining the audience? Uh, consider the setting where the Barrett Group asks Google to serve their ads to both genders. Remember that Google is incentivized to get users to click on their ads, since revenue for clicks is typically higher than those for impressions. And let's say Google finds that male users in the past have clicked on similar ads, whereas female users haven't. And based on this, Google might determine that uh, males are more likely to click and thus serve the Barrett Group's ads more to males. Or it could be that the Barrett Group was targeting high earners, and since our simulated users did not have any income data, Google may have made the inference based on some other data sources, and then use those inferences to serve these ads more to males and less to females. Yet another possibility is that Google finds other advertisers are bidding more to reach female users, and decides to serve their ads over the Barrett Group's ads to females. And in all of these cases, the Barrett Group does not explicitly ask Google to target their ads more to males and less to females. Rather, it's Google's algorithms that lead to the gender-based disparity. Now, if these were the scenarios, would the Communications Decency Act still provide Google with immunity? So <clears throat> answering that question requires uh, looking a little bit more closely at the application of the Communications Decency Act. Now, I mentioned earlier that Section 230 protects computer services, but that grant of immunity has limits. It doesn't apply to what are known as information content providers, which are defined in the statute as entities that are responsible, um, at least in part, for the development of information that is provided through the internet. And websites can be both computer services and content providers. It's, it's not an either or distinction. And courts have examined how computer services can become an information content provider. And we, we can look to one case in particular for guidance on this issue. So in 2008, the Ninth Circuit decided a case known as the roommate case, which is one of the seminal cases on, on Section 230. And in that case, a roommate matching service required users to answer questions about their sex and sexual orientation. And then it filtered search results and notifications about room opportunities using that discriminatory information. The court held that these actions rose to a level of development that removed the protection of the Communications Decency Act. So similar to roommate, the ads in the scenarios that you're describing uh, are being targeted on the basis of a protect protected category, specifically sex. And similar to roommate, the responsibility for that targeting lies with the website. Now there are a couple things to note about the targeting itself. First, we're not saying that there was any specific intent to target the ads in this way that, that was discriminatory. It's possible and even likely that there was no intent whatsoever to prevent women from seeing certain employment ads. But intent is not a relevant inquiry under the law. And the second thing to note is that the actual text of the advertisement, which the advertiser chooses, is fine. Um, as you, the, the ads that you showed, showed earlier, you know, the text itself doesn't express uh, any preference one way or the other. But what's problematic under the law is that the ad is being shown to different simulated users 
based solely on their indicated gender. And we know that's problematic because in the analogous Fair Housing Act context, selecting locations for advertising that deny segments of the population uh, information because of sex and other protected categories is prohibited. So in the scenarios that you're describing, but for the algorithm, the ads would have been shown equally to men and women. And we argue that where the algorithm plays that kind of role, it amounts to development, at least in part, under the statute, and as a result, um, the protection of Section 230 wouldn't apply. So given these outcomes are likely unintended by all parties, it raises the question of what, if anything, can be done to address it. Um, and overall, what we see in this environment is a possible misalignment of responsibility and capability. The responsible entities under Title VII, like employers and possibly advertisers, uh, such as the Barrett Group, may not be capable of preventing discrimination because they lack control over many aspects of the online advertising world. And meanwhile, capable entities like Google and other online advertising uh, networks may not have enough responsibility or incentives to prevent discrimination. Um, right, and with the right incentives, I believe companies like Google may adopt technological solutions, many of which are being actively developed by members here at, at FatStar. And on that note, Yil and I would like to thank everyone for their attention, and we are happy to take any questions. Um, so thanks for the nice talk. So one thing that um, I think is kind of interesting and complicated here is that there are certain domains where it seems like we wouldn't really care so much if an um, advertising platform is targeting specifically the people of one gender or another. So you know, both of these last two talks talked about housing ads because this is a case where there are actually laws in place, so we really do care. Um, but, you know, if a company is targeting women to sell dresses or something like this, nobody would care at all. But um, this seems to get really complicated because, um, as you're saying, there are all of these different parties involved and these things actually interact with each other. So maybe it's the case that, you know, some company is targeting women to sell dresses and because of this they're seeing fewer um, ads for high paying jobs or for houses because they're being shown these other ads instead. And I was just wondering, you know, given that it's so domain specific, do you think that the only way that companies can deal with this is to kind of have these special exceptions for how they handle certain types of ads? Like, you know, maybe if people are advertising something that is um, kind of protected by law, like hou housing or jobs or something else that have to go through a different advertising system than anything else? Or do you think that this is something that you actually can solve without kind of calling out all of these special cases? Right, that's, yeah, it's, it's a hard question because this, these systems are really complex with a whole bunch of different parties playing, uh, right? Um, and I think one solution that um, Facebook kind of adopted is to have these specific kinds of ads, um, um, like housing and employment, which they have certain additional rules that need to be satisfied. Maybe taking that kind of a, an approach um, might be a solution, but I, I, I don't really know what would be the best thing to do here. Um, yeah. Hi. Um, so I had a very similar question, so I just want to follow up, actually, and put a little more of a point on it. Um, so let's say the system was actually very simple, and Google just, you, you got to specify, an advertiser got to specify some attributes they wanted, for housing ads, you couldn't specify any attribute, let's say. Um, and for dresses, you could specify a, a gender. Or for clothing ads, you could specify a gender. And all Google did was, uh, was take the highest bidder. Uh, if, I'm a, if I'm a dress company with, a, with deep pockets and I just want to hit every person in America for a week, every woman in America for a week, um, uh, so the women aren't seeing the high paying employment ads, who is at fault here? Is it the dress company? Is it Google? Or is it the, the, the person who's putting the housing ads? It seems to me that complexity of the systems is, a, is sort of a red herring in this setting. That's my question. 
But I, I think that even in that, in the scenario you're, you're describing, it, it's still really complicated because um, the question uh, around who's at fault when you're talking about proxies and and uh, other other um, elements that might surface, um, up, that might end up targeting the ad toward a particular gender, even if you're not specifically saying target ads to women versus men. Um, assigning responsibility in that kind of scenario is, is very, very difficult under the, it, with regard to how the law would interact to an advertising network um, like Google's. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Hi, uh, Kathy Strandberg from right here. Um, I, I just wanted to, I, I'm actually using this to make the same comment I was gonna make on the previous talk because uh, I just wanted to mention that, um, in fact, uh, Till was a little bit uh, too uh, modest about their uh, interaction with policy stuff because, in fact, we've been working with them on a very similar sort of analysis about the Facebook stuff. So. Um, I think this is great, and it's really important to have different people um, coming at it in different ways. And um, so my view at this point is that as a legal, the legal question really depends on details about how the targeting is done. So it's really important to get down into understanding that. Um, but I also just wanted to comment a little bit on the uh, previous comments, which is that you know, somehow, to some extent, as a, as a lawyer, I respond to this, well, it seems really complicated, and wouldn't you have to have an extra set of reviews and stuff like that by saying, yeah, you would. <laughs> I mean, to the extent that Facebook doesn't fall under the Section uh, 230 ex ex exemption, which is like a very interesting, tricky question, to the extent it doesn't, then it has to ensure that it's, not, that it's not violating the Fair Housing Act. And how do you know which sectors matter? These are the sectors where there is legal regulation. How, which sectors should matter? That's a whole different thing. And the final thing, just to say that there's also EU law, which I'm no expert on, but which I understand is actually somewhat broader in terms of um, its, its characterization of you know, which sensitive characteristics and so on. So, um, that's also important. In, in order to, to be really fair to, to Michael and, and Hoda, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop you right there and, and end the questions for this uh, section. Uh, thank, let's uh, take a moment to thank uh, Yale and Amit for their, uh, for their excellent work and their inventive presentation style. Um,